Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Living Supernaturally with uh, David Martin, yours truly, and friends. And again, uh, the friend I've had for this series uh, is my best friend, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. Can't see him, but I guarantee you he is here with me. Praise God. We are in a series that uh, this has been one of my favorites that God has uh, had me to do because, uh, to me, It's cutting edge to what God is saying right now. And we are on the edge. I feel this so strong. I don't consider myself a prophet at all, but I feel as if I have a prophetic edge, uh, maybe prophetic insight. And I, I just have such a sense that we're on the edge of the greatest move of the Spirit of God ever. Woo! Praise God, I just get, my spirit man jumps up and down when, as I say that because it's such a sense, a strong sense within me. And as I've as I prayed about, thought about where we're going, what we're doing, I, I just know in this move of God, we're going to see the wealth of the sinner that's been stored up for the righteous coming to our hands, to those that have a heart for the kingdom of God, particularly those that have a heart to support the kingdom of God. There's going to be this great transfer of wealth. I believe we're going to see that this year greater than any time ever. I believe we're going to see a gr- the greatest harvest ever. And we're going to see the greatest demonstration, signs, wonders, and miracles at a level greater than maybe ever seen before. Uh, could well be that, as Jesus said, you know, we're going to do what he did and even greater. You know, like this uh, sign that's been happening uh, this guy was just on Sid Roth, I guess, this week. I, I didn't see him, but you know, I've heard about it from a couple of different people, and I, I know the story about how this Bible is oozing out oil. 200,000 gallons of oil has been collected. I mean, talk about a sign and a wonder. But this is the day we're in. We're in a day of supernatural demonstration, and God wants to use you. He's going to use you if you allow him to. And the key in this is what we have been speaking about. And and that's what I'm calling spiritual breakthrough. Again, I'm not going to take too much time. I recanted, recanted, that's the wrong word, recant, recounted, uh, reviewed uh, a couple of visions God's given me here over the last number of weeks. But again, God showed me back in the early 90s that we were coming into this move in the Spirit of God, a, a, a breakthrough, more signs, more wonders, more miracles than we've ever seen possible. But in order to step into that dimension, the fullness of it, we needed to prepare ourselves. And uh, the way we do that, God said to me, is prayer, fasting, and self-denial. And the fruit of that, prayer, fasting, and self-denial, is what I call sensitivity. And I, I think of it this way. If, you, if you're going to operate with sensitivity, then you need to sensitize. And again, the way we're going to sensitize is through prayer, fasting, and self-denial. And God showed me that uh, the breakthrough, again, the picture was a picture of a wall, a barrier, and we, the church, myself, literally in the vision, went right through a wall, but the wall was only paper thin. It was an illusion. And and this is what you and I need to know. It doesn't matter how bad a circumstance may look in front of you, how impossible it may seem, nothing is too difficult for God. We have to know that He is not limited by natural. He's not limited by this by by you know what we can see uh, or what we can comprehend. He is a God of unlimited ability. So, you know, if you know, I think of the story of Heidi Baker. She was sharing how she was being chased by some terrorists over in Mozambique. And they were coming, they were chasing her in a vehicle. And she came up on the road to cement pillars. There, there was no way that she was going to go. And she was caught like in a trap, if you will. And she said, God, what do I do? And he just said, drive. And what happened was she literally drove right through those barriers other car didn't have that privilege but see that's the ability of god i shared this a while back the story of a team 
from the church I was at 20 years ago for, for over 20 years. I knew these people. They were a, a, a praise and worship team doing a seminar over in uh, Hawaii. And uh, while well, they were coming down the mountain, they were, they were about to have a head-on collision with another a truck. They were in a car, but you know, they, were, they, were, they all tell the same story. They braced for a collision. And what they all said is they literally went right through the other vehicle. Now, Daniel Amstutz, who was the praise and worship leader, the head of the group, said that earlier in that day, God really put it upon his heart to pray in the Holy Spirit. So all the opportunity he had in between teaching sessions that day, he was praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. And you know, I'm not sure exactly how that prepared them, but again, you know, prayer, fasting, and self-denial sets the stage for the operation of the supernatural and allows us to be sensitive. But they all shared the same story. They went right through that other vehicle. That's the God we serve. Now, God wants you to know that you can do these kind of exploits and even greater things than you can even possibly imagine. That's the day, that's the season that we're in. How exciting is that, amen? But again, what God has really put on my heart is the need for us to be sensitive, to be in tune to that prompting in your heart, that inward witness to the voice of the Spirit. And if, if we have time today, uh, we'll see how it goes, because I have literally, I've never done this kind of thing before, uh, but God put this on my heart. We're going to go through approximately 40 scriptures. We're going to do it kind of quickly, but I want to share with you what the Bible says about humility. And uh, again, we started this series. I shared the vision I had shared with you, and, and God said to me, the barrier that you and I that, the, the, that God showed me in the vision was intellectual. It's our human understanding. It's the way we think based on you know, natural, carnal, worldly knowledge, human, human understanding. And driving through a wall or driving through a pillar or going through another vehicle does not match normal ways of thinking. But we need to change the way we think and recognize that we have Almighty God on the inside of us. Greater is he that is inside of you than he that is in the world. Amen. You have a God of miracles, supernatural. You've got to get that into your heart. A God that's able to do woo, exceedingly abundantly. Many years ago, I was teaching on the uh, scriptures in, in First John there where it says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I like to use illustrations, and I ask God, God, how could I illustrate the reality of, of the greatness of you on the inside of us compared to the devil, in, you know, the one that's constantly harassing us and stealing or trying to steal, kill and destroy? And said, you know, you know, we've got to get this, uh, this uh, understanding of the greatness, the revelation. That's what it really is. It's a revelation of Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can do all things through Christ, the anointing, in you, unlimited. Anyway, I, I ask God, how can I illustrate that? And it's kind of a funny story. Unfortunately, it's a true story, kind of embarrassing, and maybe you've heard me say this before, but back when, uh, I'm not sure how old I was, maybe late teens, maybe early 20s, but I was beyond that being a, a, a kid anyway. Uh, but I, I was at someone's house uh, to pick them up. And we're going somewhere. So I'm waiting on the porch, waiting for the person to come out. And as I'm sitting on the step, I noticed on the step, I was an ant. And the ant was just, you know, minding his own business, walking across, you know, the concrete on the porch. And, uh, you know, this is <laughs> a picture of real boredom, I guess. But I decided to play with the ant. Yeah, that's right. I said that. <laughs> I'm going to play with the ant, a little carpenter type of an ant. So it's a pretty big ant. But anyway, <clears throat> I, I decided to put my finger down and you know to see if he'd go around it, climb over it, or what he would do. And he, he just turned around and went the other way. So I put it down on the other side of him. And after <clears throat> you know maneuvering the little ant back and forth, right and left, and so forth, you know probably 15, 20 seconds of doing that, I, I had this idea, 
of giving him a thrill ride. Now, ants in Oklahoma have them all the time with all the tornadoes that go through here. But uh, this was back when I was living in Wisconsin. I'm thinking, you know, this ant has probably never been on a thrill ride, never went to Six Flags. And I took it upon myself to give the ant uh, a, a, a thrill. <laughs> well, maybe he didn't think of it that way. But uh, So what I did is I got down on the cement, you know, so I'm, I'm right down in his face, per se, and I use my marble flicking finger, and you, you know, some might remember your younger days of playing marbles, and you put the marble down and flick it with your finger, and marble flies, you know, distance. Well, I decided to, to flick the ant. So I did that, and I flicked him, and uh, I aimed him, though, at uh, the, the door of the house where I was sitting, waiting for the person to come out. And when I did that, I mean, it took off like a rocket. I mean, he probably went two, three feet up in the air and he smacked right into that door and came down. And to my amazement, when he came down, he came marching right back at me. I mean, literally, it's like, wow, how about some more of this? That was great fun. I'm sure that's not what he was thinking, but that's my interpretation. So anyway, he comes back and I, I do it again. And I flick him again and give him a, fly and, a flying leap. And he hits the house again. And uh, this time he did not fare so well. And uh, when he landed, I think only one, maybe two of uh, the legs that he had, like six or eight legs, I'm not sure what, I think ants have six, but only like one was working. And he was just kind of going in a circle. And, I, and whenever I tell the story in the church, I can always see the people in the church Oh, you did that to the ant. Come on, we all done it. You stepped on an ant hill or two in your life and took out a whole bunch of them at one time. So anyway, yeah, I did that to the ant. But anyway, mercy came in because I saw that he was really a suffering little little guy. And so I took him out of his misery and I went over there with my pointing finger and I went, <laughs> done, all over. And then I brushed him off and threw him on, 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 the, on the sidewalk or the grass next to the porch. Now, I know, I know, I know, I can, I'll never tell a story. I can always tell people feeling sorry for the ant, but again, we've all done it. But the point is that that's the, that's the picture that God gave me when I'm asking him, how can I illustrate this? How can I, how can I demonstrate with a story the reality of the greatness of you on the inside of us compared to the, the littleness of, of the devil. And, and the Bible tells us, I think it's Isaiah 14, or it's either Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28. But it's, it talks about, you know, in Isaiah 14, it talks about the five I wills of Satan and then how he is cast down to the earth. And then Ezekiel 28 is God's response with his five I wills. <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure it's in Isaiah 14. I'm not going to take time to go there right now, but... There it says that when we see the devil for who he really is, when our eyes are opened, when we really get to see the devil for who he is, we're going to say, this is that, that, that tr tormented and troubled the nations, the world. I mean, when, when you get a hold of this revelation, greater is he that is inside of you. When you, when you grab hold of this revelation of the authority that you have in the name of Jesus, the power that you have in the name of Jesus. I mean, all of hell trembles when you come to a place of that revelation because you're unstoppable. And God wants you to have that, that revelation. So when we get to heaven probably is what he's talking about in Isaiah there 14. But when we come to that fullness of revelation, we're going to be in awe of the reality of how, how, how nothing Satan is in all of his, you know, his dominions underneath him and authorities underneath him and that right down to the little demons you and I deal with on a daily basis. But when we see the reality of who we are in Christ, it's, it's the picture of the ant. It's the ant. Had, I have in that I had total dominion over that ant, total dominion, and that's what you and I have over the devil, total dominion, full 
authority, but we have to walk in it. We have to know we have it, number one, and we have to walk in it, number two. And that's kind of what I want to help you to understand. And right now, what God is showing me in, in where we are in this series of, of having this breakthrough is God has taken me back to, to, to these two visions. So the first vision, again, related to spiritual breakthrough. And we have to get this reality of our, our unlimited ability in Christ and how we are so superior to everything in this world because of who we are. In, in, in I should say maybe more than who we are, it's, yeah, that's true, but it's who's inside of us. It's the Christ in you that at the name of Jesus, the Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every name named in heaven and earth and under the earth has to bow its knee. And you have use of that. You have use of that name and that authority. Hallelujah. Well, the second vision is where I want to pick up on today. And that is where, again, I can go through it in great detail. I've talked about it twice already. But in the church, I'm on the, I'm on the worship team. And, and this goes back all the way back to 1983. We had just moved to Oklahoma. And the, the God gave me the only open vision I've ever had where, I mean, literally my eyes were wide open and I was seeing something no one else was seeing. And what God showed me is our roof disappeared, or the ceiling, the roof, everything. And I'm looking at the sky and God shows me this, this sphere of light. And from the sphere of light, which he said was symbolic of his throne room of grace, beams of light were coming down and touching different people in the church. And one person was receiving a healing. Somebody else was getting a financial miracle. Somebody else was getting a restoration. And what was amazing is these people weren't asking for it. God said to me, I'm ministering to those that are ministering me. They're ministering me in spirit and truth. And what he showed me in all that was the, the attitude that was in their heart was that of humility. That when we come to this place of true, pure humility, we recognize how insignificant we are in ourselves. And I guarantee you, you try to come up against any demon, any power of darkness in self, you're going to lose. I mean, the smallest demon in hell will, will, will take full advantage of you. But with the authority of Christ in you, the, the devil himself has to bow his knee when we walk in the authority with the name of Jesus. But in ourselves, we, we're, we're dunners. <laughs> not, that's, not sure, that's not a good word. But in Christ, amen, everything has to be in Christ. Well, what God showed me is, again, these, these people that were receiving this provision, this supernatural, uh, I think it was an outpouring, because they weren't asking for it. And God was just blessing them, ministering to them, because they were ministering to him. Well, and then he showed me th these illustrations. One was a, a picture of a, of a car battery with a positive post and a negative post. And on the positive side of a battery, you have all the power. On the negative side of the battery, you have a, a total void of power. So what happens is all the power on the positive side wants to get into the empty side. So it brings a balance in the battery. So but what happens is if you cross those two posts, like with a screwdriver, you're going to see sparks. <clears throat> those sparks are going to have enough heat to literally melt the tip of the screwdriver right off because this is, and there's so much power there. And what God said to me is that symbolic of us with humility. It's like we are the negative, God is the positive, and what happens is all of his power, because he is El Shaddai, he is the positive, he is the all-sufficient one, amen? So all that he is wants to come inside of you. And that's what I was seeing in this vision is the, the outpouring of God coming from his throne of grace and just supernaturally blessing people. You know, you know he says we don't need to ask for anything, really, because he knows what we have need of. And that's what was happening with these people. Now, the next picture he showed me was that of two magnets. 
And again, magnets have a plus side and a negative side, a positive and negative polarity as it would be. And if you try to put two positives together, they, they, they push apart, they repel. Two negatives do the same thing. But if you take a positive and a negative, they attract and they are actually held together by an unseen force called magnetism. Well, God said the same thing is true in the spirit realm. There's an unseen spiritual force that will connect God to us. It will attract him to us. And again, the idea is our insufficiency, called it humility, and his all-sufficiency. And when, when he sees that insufficiency in us, then he's attracted to us. And everything he has wants to come inside of you. Outpouring of the Spirit is how I think of it. And when I looked up to see what I was getting, there was nothing there. Even though I was very busy for God, I made great sacrifices. And I said, God, how come? And he said to me, you're not worshiping me in spirit and truth. And that he took me on this journey and began teaching me then what real worship is. And we looked at this again, just finishing up this recap, in Romans 12, where it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. I call that death to self. It's no longer we that live. It's Christ. As Jesus says, if anyone's going to be my disciple, let him take up the cross and follow me. Well, cross, staros in the Greek, means a place where one dies. Now, the, 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 the issue at hand that you and I need to face, on, face head on and deal with is self. And we have to bring a level of death to our self that we allow Jesus to be on the throne of our life, that he is the one that is leading us. He is the Lord of our lives. Now, for many people, he is not the Lord. He is their Savior, but he is not their Lord. They're, they're doing what they're wanting to do, and they're asking God to bless what they're doing, and even when it might be a good thing. You know, a God thing, it's not that which God has planned for you, and that's what he wants. He wants us to walk in the center of his will. That self isn't part of the equation. But so often, you know, self wants to, to be in charge. It's just a very human thing to want to be in charge. And what God is trying to do is to get us out of that humanness, out of our carnality. And as Proverbs 3, 5 says, to, to trust him with all of our heart to lean not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. That means he'll bring prosperity to you. He'll cause you to be blessed in the city and blessed in the country, blessed in your coming, blessed in your going. And everything that you put your hand to, that's his desire. He wants to bless you. And again, you don't even have to ask for it. When you're walking in, in this level of humility that he is seeking, he is going to find you. And he's already, I mean, he's already in you, but the blessings of God are going to find you. His supernatural provision is going to find you. His supernatural protection above and beyond the, the normal. You know, we're going to look at a verse here in a minute here as we look at some of these verses, but it says, God resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. See, so even though you're a child of God, not all children of God are blessed in the same way. Just like Hebrews 11:6 6 says, he is a rewarder to those that diligently seek him. So, you know, as an avid seeker of God, you're going to enjoy more of the blessings. Why? Because God is a rewarder. <clears throat> it's the same concept. So, now he gives more grace so praise God for the grace we have. Praise God. I, I love Charles Capp's definition of grace. God's ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Amen. Praise God for, you know, whatever skills we have, talents we have, and education we have, and, and training we have. But all of that is nothing 
compared to God's ability in you to make a way, to open a door, to create a door, to, to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Again, grace, God's ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So praise God for the grace that we have. You know, praise God for the grace that God's given us that by faith we could be saved. But there's greater dimensions, greater operations of the Spirit of God that God is wanting us to step into. And I believe we're in a season where there's a greater dynamic, a greater measure or something. Just as it's happening in a bigger way, a glorious way. And it's all part of what I believe is happening in the plan of God of establishing heaven on earth. Praise God. Woo! Tell you what, I got goosebumps on that one. So, but what God showed me is that the reason I wasn't receiving things, even though I was very busy and actively involved in multiple ways, I, I didn't have the heart that God wanted me to have. And again, so it takes me to Romans 12. Again, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto me. And then King James says, which is your reasonable service, and that's the version I was using at the time. I, I've since transferred over to, or, or changed over to New American Standard, which is, a, in my opinion, as I've studied now for 40 years, a more accurate translation. And But the Greek word there for reasonable service in King James is logikos, and New American Standard more accurately translates that as your spiritual service of worship. See, dying to yourself, which is what Jesus wants you to do as a disciple. If you're going to be his disciple, you need to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow him. So, but then it goes on to say, so again, so it's your reasonable, reasonable service of worship. So again, what God was showing me is helping me to understand the vision and why some were receiving and others weren't, including myself, is again, I, was, I didn't have the, the worship in this aspect of my life. I mean, yes, I did worship in, in, in praising God in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the worship services and I was living for him but there's a there's this heart thing that God is looking for and he recognizes it when, when you have this recognition oh I need God that you can you only have this breath right now you only have this breath because God gave it to you you whatever you have it's only because of his grace only because of his love everything in this world is only because of him and he wants us to come to this place of submission and surrender and choose because we have this recognition of our need so what happens is in verse number two it says and be not conformed to this world and this is what i see as i travel the world i i see christians they're so worldly. They're so carnal. They're, they, it's hard to tell most Christians from the world because they look and act, talk just like the world. We should be looking so different. We should be walking in a place, and I'm, I, I'm so convicted of this in my own life that I, I really am I'm, I'm working on a plan of more prayer, more, more self-denial, more fasting, because I want to walk in the fullness of this even greater, so much so that when we walk into a room, people will feel the convicting power of God. Amen? That's what God wants you to do, to have that kind of relationship with him that you're so much removed. He's, you're, 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 your life's all about him. And so it goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world. And, and by the way, that's an emphatic imperative in the Greek. In other words, it's not a suggestion to not look like the world. It's a command with authority. And it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That means it's the same word for transfiguration. Be supernaturally changed. That's the light of God I'm telling you about that brings conviction and it brings hope and it, it brings promise to those people that are around you because people are looking for the real deal. They're looking for hope. They're looking for promise and you have it 
and he has a name. It's called Jesus. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it says, and be not conformed, but be transformed, supernaturally changed by the renewing of your mind, then you may prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Amen. Now, sometimes people say God has three wills, his good, his good will, his acceptable will, and his perfect will. I, I don't read it that way. He has one will for you to prosper and be in good health. That will that he has, it's good, it's acceptable, and, it's, and besides that, it's perfect. And what he wants you and I to do is be so submitted to him with humility that he is able to mold us and, and, and lead us and guide us by his spirit that all the blessings of God are ours. Amen. So, bottom line, what he said to me is, David, you need to learn humility. You need to walk in a greater level of humility, a greater recognition of your need for me, your need for my leading, your need for my word, your need for my correction, your need for my, to go, my, my grace to go before you, to open a door, to make a way. And for me, it was challenging because, you know, I was very self-reliant. I was very talented and gifted to do what I was doing and to take my hands off the steering wheel and take my hands off the throttle and let God drive the car as it would be. It was not an easy thing. You know, it was an easy thing to let Jesus be right along next to me and driving me as my, my co-pilot. But he made it real clear to me, David, I want to be the pilot. I want to tell you where to turn. I want to be your navigator. I, you know, I, just trust me. And it, it took time. And I shared with you last week how, you know, when I was called to the ministry, I, I went through a six-month journey of learning uh, submission, learning humility, learning to trust him. And I'm hoping we have enough time after I go through the scriptures to tell you the reward of that because it's proof in the pudding. Incredible, absolutely incredible story of what God did as a result of my submission to Him and learning humility. So now, well, here's what I want to do. I have, I'm going to bring my Bible program up here, of course you're not going to see it, uh, but I'm going to be able to refer to it. And I want to take you on a journey through, again, I, I didn't count them, but there's probably close to 40 verses here that, and obviously I can't teach on any of them or we'll never get through and then have enough time at the end to, to share this incredible testimony with you the, the blessings and, and the, the fruit if you will of uh, learning humility and submitting to Jesus and okay so here we're going to start now these are in no specific order and, and what I do is I try to read my Bible cover to cover every year and as I do I, I mark a verse and I, and I mark it with a bookmark and I, I label it and it goes into an electronic file under different categories probably got 50 different categories and one of those categories is humility so what I've done here today is I've just pulled all the verses I marked with humility uh, and I'm going to read them to you to show you what the Bible says, what God's Word says about humility and the reward for humility. So, hopefully I'm going to try to do this in uh, 15 minutes. That'll give me just over 10 minutes to wrap up and share this testimony with you. So we're going to start again. There's no order here at all. It's, it's just the order that they were saved in my list. And uh, there may be some kind of divine order, but it's, if so, it's not planned. So we start in 1 Timothy 1.14. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. That's Paul speaking. And Paul is acknowledging his need for Christ because he recognized he is a sinner. Now, you know, one of the things, you, you probably know this and this you're kind of new to the ministry here, but 40 years ago, God gave me the verse of John 14, verse 12, where Jesus said, He that believes in me 
will do what I do and even greater. Well, that's been my life mission, to study how to do what Jesus did and greater. And a few years ago, God dropped this incredible truth in my heart. But he said to me, if you want to do what Jesus did, then do what Jesus did. Got that? If you want to do what Jesus did, then do what Jesus did. So here is a perfect example of what is it that Jesus did. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I'm sorry. Uh, in a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He forsook all in heaven to come to earth as a humble servant in, to a point of dying a horrible death because he loves you. We need to do that same thing. I have the willingness to lay down our life for our friend. And who's, what greater friend can you have than Jesus? Amen. I always talk about that at the beginning of my show when I'm all by myself. My greatest friend is the Holy Spirit. Well, i, I got to stop putting too many comments in here. We'll never get through this. And I, I do want to share the testimony with you. Okay, it's Philippians 2, verse 7. Being formed in the appearance, I'm sorry, I'm starting in verse 8 here. We go back up here a little bit. Uh, verse 8, there we go. Being found in the appearance as a man, and this is actually the verse I was thinking of. Uh, it was the last verse, of, it worked, but that's really Paul's testimony. But here's Jesus' testimony, of, in other words, doing what he did. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Ultimate humility. Philippians, uh, uh, well, actually, it's the same verse. I marked it twice here. It started, actually, let me go back here, because it actually started in verse number six. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, seven, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man, in the verse we just read, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 1 Peter 5, it says, uh, verse number 5, Younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Whenever I read this, I, I, I love the concept here where it says, clothe yourselves with humility. So you know, by, over and over we see this phrase to put on the new man, put on the garment of Christ. Here, to clothe yourselves. Now, same thing, you gotta put on the garment. <laughs> If you never thought of it before, Christianity is a put on. You have to put on the garment of praise. You have to put on the cloth of humility. You have to put on the new man. Amen. It's a choice, just like getting dressed in the morning. When you wake up, you have to choose to clothe yourself with humility. It's not natural to your natural mind or your natural man, uh, your, your flesh as it would be. Going forward here, and we come to Romans 12, uh, verse number 16, and it says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Again, humility is going to look at all people equally. You're not going to look at someone you know, of low esteem as inferior to you. But we're going to look at all people, you know, with unconditional love. Okay. Uh, Acts 20, verse 19. It says, you know, again, Serving the Lord with all humility and tears in the trials which came upon me through the plots of Jews. Talking about Paul. And again, how he, he, he walked his journey of life with humility. And it wasn't, hard, it, wasn't, it wasn't always easy. 
Paul had a lot of trials and tribulations, and we need to keep the heart a mindset of humility regardless of the conditions of the world or in our own personal lives. Luke 18, verse 14, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that word exalted means brought to a higher place. Brought to a place, actually one definition means brought to a place of prosperity. And when you hear the testimony, you're going to see how that played out in my own life. Uh, uh, Luke 18, verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and to him that humbled himself shall be exalted. Next, Luke 9, uh, 48. And he said, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Amen. The more you walk in humility, the greater you are in the eyes of God. Luke 1, verse 52, it says, He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humbled. Exalted, exalted again means to bring to a higher place and bring to a place of blessing and prosperity. Okay, next one. Matthew 18, verse 4, Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is greater in the kingdom of heaven. Zephaniah 3, verse 12, I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. Amen. Matthew, jumping around here, Matthew 21, verse 42. Uh... That one actually doesn't even belong in here. I'm going to show a skip over that one. It's not marked. We'll go to Isaiah 66, verse 2. For my hand made all these things, God speaking, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, who trembles at my word. Spend a whole hour talking about this and the, and the need we have for the reverential fear of the Lord, trembling at his word, humble and contrite. Amen. What's going to happen for that one? He's going to be blessed. Uh, on to the next one. Somebody's coming up twice. <clears throat> Isaiah 2, verse 17. The pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isaiah 2, verse 12, it says, For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. In other words, if you don't humble yourself, God will do it for you. Don't want to go there. Isaiah, <clears throat> oh, no, and then him twice again. Proverbs 29, uh, verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs 16, verse 19. It is better to be humble in the spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the the proud. Proverbs 27, 19. No, that's another one that doesn't belong there. Sorry about that. Uh, Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is wisdom. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm hoping to see here is the blessings of being humble. The, the, how God, God's viewpoint of humility uh, Psalm 146, verse 8, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Psalm 145, verse 14, The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. 
a, a position of humility. You know, so, so often, you know, people say, you know, I don't have to lift my hands at church to worship God. You know, you don't have to. You get to. But God honors <clears throat> positions of humility. So one position of humility is lifting your hands. Another position of humility is bowing down. The greatest position of humility and submission is when you lay prostrate before the Lord. But again, he, he sustains those who humble themselves. Uh, Psalm 76, verse 9. When God arose to judgment to save all the humble of the earth, praise God. Psalm 10, verse 17. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. Again, when you walk in this humility, just like I saw in the vision, God knows what you need. You don't have to ask for anything. You're attracting the blessings, the provision, and the protection of God. Psalm 25, verse 9. <clears throat> he leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. I love that verse. Uh, Psalm 35, verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. See, again, you know, fasting is, is one of the facets or operations of humility. Because when you're fasting, you're recognizing your need for God. You're recognizing your 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 wanting to hear from him and that you're 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 dying to yourself. Kind of keep going, can't talk. <laughs> Psalm 51 verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And again, contrite is another synonym for humility. Uh, Psalm 3711, but the humble will inherit the land, those are one of my favorites, and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm looking at my, looking at my calendar for time here. I think we're going to get through this whole list. <clears throat> it says in uh, Psalm 69, verse 29, it says, but I am afflicted and in pain. May salvation, may your salvation, O God, set me securely and high. I will praise the name of God with song, magnify him with thanksgiving, and it will please the Lord better than an ox or a young bull with horns and hoofs. The humble have seen it and are glad. You who seek God, let your heart revive, for the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his who are prisoners. Praise God. Ezra. <clears throat> Verse, uh, eight, uh, chapter 8, verse number 21. Then I proclaimed the fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek him, seek him from, I'm uh, sorry, seek, seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all of our possessions. Again, by fasting, we humble ourselves. One facet, again, of how we humble ourselves. And here's the classic one, uh, Second Chronicles 7, 14. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I'm going to have to stop here. We're not even halfway through the list, but I want to leave enough time here to share this testimony with you of how God rewarded uh, my journey of, of submission and learning how to trust God and, and humbling myself. Uh, I'm going to go through all that. I did that last week, but literally I had a, a six-figure job back in 1980. In 1982, I started there in 1979. But 1982, incredible job, six-figure income, co company car, traveling the world, expense account. It just had every a perfect, perfect, uh, it was wonderful. And God said to leave it and go to ministry. But he didn't say what to do. I gave the company like eight weeks notice. And, uh, you know, I all I knew is I had to quit. And I had to get prepared for ministry. Well, what happened is 
first off, I had a company car. I had to turn the company car in. And uh, so I, I went to the dealership and uh, I had total confidence in God. And so I bought a new car, not a big fancy car, a Subaru car. Uh, but I made a down payment and I left a balance of uh, $8,000. And they said to me, how are you going to pay for it? And I, in, in total confidence, because I've always seen God do such great things, I just said, uh, well, I'll, I'll pay cash in, in 90 days. No idea where that was going to come from. Uh, but that's what I did. So, again, uh, we didn't have a lot of savings. And some of the savings that I had, I just used to buy this car and balance now of $8,000 that we were going to pay cash on. And God wouldn't allow me to work. I mean, I did little menial things, very embarrassing kind of things, did painting of mailboxes and stuff like that to earn a little bit of extra money. And over the course of, of weeks and months as this thing progressed, you know, people started bringing us groceries. We find little money here and there, and in our wish, in our window washer. I mean, window washer, window, window wipers, and in our car, my Bible. We find money in different places. People helping us. And when you're you, when you're used to being a major giver, and now you're receiving, it was really, really challenging. And we, that went on for six months. And now uh, it's June. And God says to me, I want you to go to Ramah. And I didn't know what Ramah was. Honestly, I knew it was a Greek word. I had read one half of one of Brother Hagen's books. I thought he was kind of weird. And uh, actually found out from a friend of mine, ironically, uh, one of my best friends, actually, he got the same word from God going to Ramah the same week I did. And it was, it was really cool. But he told me that Ramah was Brother Hagen's school. Uh, oh, man. And I, I discovered uh, I, I was just very immature because Brother Hagen was a wonderful man of God. And I, I just didn't have uh, enough knowledge when I read half of one book. But anyway, God sent me to Ramah. And, uh, and he told me that in June. So my friend Bill and I, he's going to go to Ramah too. So we decided from Wisconsin to come down to Ramah to check out housing. Uh, and... Before we left uh, for Rama, uh, knowing now I'm going to have to sell our house, in 1982 was a major, or actually 1983 now, was a major recession. And we had a very nice little home on the lake. And unfortunately, because of the recession, the value of the house was very, very low. And uh, there was like four or five other houses on the peninsula that we lived on, all for sale. All been on the market for many months. Nothing was selling. So when I got the appraiser, I mean, I had a real realtor come out and do an appraisal. I was not happy with it. So I thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pay for an appraiser to give me a better deal. And the, the paid appraisal actually was worse. So then I called another realtor. Someone said, hey, this one always comes out high. And it was about the same. So anyway... <clears throat> So we had a, like a value, I think it was like $65,000 was the, the highest one that we had on our house. I can remember this was, you know, uh, 1980. It was 1980. 1980, I think 1983, I'll get it right. June of, no, June of 82, I'll get it right here. June of 82, because we came to Rhema in 1982. So anyway, uh, we, we come here and we're, I, I have a whole list of things that we want for our house. Oh, I didn't tell you this. Okay, so in January, I bought the car three months, right? I'm going to pay in cash. Well, that didn't happen. So I paid interest and said, this is going to be another 90 days. So that's going to take us at this point to the first part of July. So anyway, now we're here in June. We're down looking at houses. And Bill and I looked at just, uh, I don't want to say hundreds, but dozens of houses. And we didn't find anything that, you know, well, he found some he liked. I found some that were okay, but nothing that really was what we really wanted. But we spent, you know, a whole week looking. And uh, also, I, I was able to look for a job. God said to me, now you can find a job. Well, in the first couple of days, I found a job here as a marketing director for a company. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, the, the day before we left, uh, in a Bible study, God speaks to me, and he said, 
uh, sell your house back in Wisconsin yourself. Don't use a realtor. Sell it yourself. And he also said to me, when you sell it, sell it for $8,000 over the highest price that you got. So, okay, I'm going to do that. So now, the day before we're going to go home, we decided to go out to the lake and uh, just check out one of the nearby lakes. It was really beautiful. So we're driving out to uh, go check out this lake. And as we're driving down the highway, clearly God said to me, turn, your house is down this road. And I said, I said, Bill, I got to turn here. He said, why? He said, God just spoke to me and said, my house is down this road. And, and he said, did you see a sign? I said, no, I, I heard it in my heart. And, and so we turned. And after we turned, we looked to see if there was a sign to confirm what I believe God said to me. There was no sign. So we're going down the road, and I'm driving slowly, and you know, kind of looking for what what's God's going to say next. And we drove by one street. No, don't turn there. Went down about a quarter mile, and there's another street. And God said, "This is it. Your house is on this street." And it was understand. He's speaking to me in a still small voice in my heart and, and it was not audible in any way shape or form it was just more of a down here's your house type thing so i turned and there was eight houses on this road and they were it's a brand new subdivision addition as they say down here uh so we drove down to the end of the road it's a couple hundred yards and back and all the all the houses were on acreage so you know it was nice properties or nice houses but there was none for sale. They were all brand new, but none for sale. So I saw a guy cutting his grass, and I said uh, to this guy, I said, <laughs> I'll be in forward, which one of these houses is for sale? And he laughed, and he said, none of them. They're all, they're all you know, like less than two years old, and they're, they're just, it's a brand new area. And he said, there's not, none that are for sale that I know of. He said, but they are building one down there in, in the grove, kind of a, a, a major wooded lot. So you could not see this house that was being built. So but he said, yeah, just go down the windy driveway and you, you'll, you'll see a house that's being built. Thought, okay. So we went down there. And sure enough, behind all those trees was this house that was being built. And it was only like half done. I went up to the guy that was working there and asked him about the house. And he, I said, is this house for sale? He said, no, I'm, I'm building it for this guy. I'm the contractor. He built all the houses on that road. And I said, do you think he might sell it? And he said, I don't think so. I said, well, if he would, what would it probably sell for? And he said, well, yeah, probably high 80s, low 90s. And uh, I said, okay. Now, remember, God told me to sell my house for uh, $8,000 over what it was appraised for, which meant we had 65000 plus eight to work with. But anyway, God also said to me, and I'll tell you this, he said, do not pay more for your house here than what you're selling your house for there. Okay. Now, also, I knew in the back of my mind that $8,000 was due at the bank. And I was kind of thinking, well, maybe that's that $8,000 over the value. So I already calculated that in, which means I can only pay 65000 for this house. So anyway, I asked the guy for the owner's name and number, and I called the guy up, and uh, I said, hey, I'm interested in your house. Would you, would you be interested in selling it? And he said, no. I said, well, let me ask you a question. If you were to consider selling it, what, what do you think it's worth? <laughs> and again, <laughs> did you not hear me? I'm not interested in selling it. I said, I know. I, I know what he said. But tell me, what, what, what do you think you might sell it for? And he said, I'm not thinking about selling it, but the house is probably worth, you know, what the other guy said, you know, high 80s, something like that, maybe a little 90s, is what, what the value of the properties are there. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm interested in buying your house, but I can only spend $65,000. So tell me, I'll tell you what, when you change your mind, call me. He laughed. He said, I am not going to change my mind. I said, I understand. But just would you do me a favor and just write my name and number down? He did. Well, two weeks later, he called me and we got the house. He And because of not having a job, 
and just starting a new job, we couldn't get financing. He even financed it for us. And, and that is the provision of God. That's the favor of God. Whew. That's what he's doing right now. That's what he wants to do in your life, to lead you and guide you and, and, and direct you supernaturally to the blessings and the provision of God in a greater way than you've maybe ever experienced before. I'm about out of time. We're at one hour here. We'll give me another couple minutes. I'll finish up because the story gets even gooder. So I put an ad in the paper to sell our house for $8,000 over the highest value. And we went on a little mini vacation. Some folks treated us to a week away. And so we planned, the, we planned an open house for the day after we came back. We come back from this little mini vacation and there's a note on our door and says, call me, we'd like to see your house. We saw your ad in the paper for the open house for Sunday. So we're still unloading our car, but I called the number right away and the people came out and they bought the house, cash. $8,000 over the highest appraisal value, which gave me the money to pay off the car just in time that was due well, within the closing of the house. That's our God. When you humble yourself, He's going to exalt you. He is going to promote you. He is going to put you into places of opportunity. Yeah, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be segues in the journey, and there's going to be some ups, there's going to, some, going to be some downs. But you know, we go through the valleys of the shadow of death. We fear no evil because He knows He's with us, and He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And many times, you know, the the low places, the valleys, is where we're going to be learning some things that we need to get to the next mountaintop. I'm telling you, friend, we serve an awesome God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He wants you to, to walk at a higher level. And if we can just choose to humble ourselves, we'll watch this incredible work of the Holy Spirit beyond anything you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you again for the privilege you give me here week after week to speak into your life. I, I, it's really an honor for me to do this. And I thank you for helping us uh, to pay our bills and, and uh, you know, cost money to do all the stuff we do and, and mission trips and traveling around the country. And this tomorrow, actually Thursday, I'm leaving on a two-week trip for Pennsylvania and Maryland. And then we get back, we're going to be going off uh, in May to Germany and, and France. But, you know, it takes money to run the ministry. The gospel's free, but it takes money. And the only way we're able to do it is faithful partners. So would you pray about being a faithful partner? Or maybe just make a single donation, whatever. Help us to make a difference. We've got a vision for over 100 million souls to be saved, discipled, and serving God. And you can help that to become a reality. And when you get to heaven, you're going to hear all these people say, thank you for giving to the Lord. Amen. Hey, I'm going to be on the road next week, but we're going to do it from Pennsylvania. So I'll be back here next Tuesday, and uh, we'll see what God has planned. I don't, not sure where we're going just yet. If we're going to continue any more on this or something different, but by next Tuesday, we'll know. Have another great time together. Again, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing and for liking and sharing these videos. It helps us to grow, increase our reach, and uh, until next time. Blessings to you. Oops.